this session is actually uh, you know it's it's really relevant to india uh, for um, as you all know uh, india has just witnessed one of the most uh, radical reforms since the 90s which is the new bankruptcy code and uh, uh, of course as we are still setting up institutions we are still learning how to grapple with different kinds of situations arising under our new law uh, learning from uh, countries which already have an established bankruptcy institutional framework is hugely beneficial so without further ado i would request uh, okay anthony is already here so anthony will be presenting a paper on bankruptcy on the side which i'm presuming deals with um, prepacks and arrangements between creditors outside of the bankruptcy uh, system uh, anthony all right. yours thank you so uh I exactly as was said, this paper is Bankruptcy on the Side, and, and what my co-authors, Ken I and David Skeel and I are talking about our uh, deals that creditors make on the side uh, that change the rules of bankruptcy. So most of what I write about is U.S. bankruptcy law, and in particular the ways parties try to opt out of a mandatory system. And one of the most, probably the most common way to do that, to opt out of the rules, are to have intercreditor agreements on the side, and so you have a first lien lender or a second lien lender, and they have an agreement about how they're how they are going to behave when bankruptcy arrives. Uh, and so this paper looks at the effects and the importance of those agreements. Um, it is a U.S. focused paper, but this is a I think this problem will exist in any system that has a mandatory bankruptcy mandatory rules in bankruptcy. So what what do you do when some of the stakeholders have agreements to control their behavior? in the future. So we're not talking about agreements that happen after the bankruptcy is filed. We're talking about agreements that happen long before bankruptcy is even known to have occurred. So you're saying, if bankruptcy occurs, how are we going to behave? The most common type of agreement is the intercreditor agreement. The first lien creditor and a second lien creditor have an agreement that says, and usually, almost always, it's the following version, the second lien has to ask permission from the first lien before it does certain things in the bankruptcy process. So it can't propose financing. It can't object to a plan. It can't propose its own plan, unless the first lien lender agrees. So in some sense, one creditor has agreed to be silent, uh, whereas the other creditor has all the voice. You can also have uh, um, an agreement where a guarantor says, if the debtor files for bankruptcy, they'll pay a, a penalty. So often you have personal guarantees where you want the CEO not to put the the uh, debtor in bankruptcy. And so this, this issue comes up, and if you talk to the Delaware and New York bankruptcy judges, it comes up in virtually every case. And so they've structured, they, they've, they've dealt with the question of how to interpret these structures. And over the last decade or so, you have varying approaches. So the earlier cases were, we're just not going to enforce agreements between creditors that tell them how to behave in bankruptcy. Why? Because it's a mandatory system, and the whole point of bankruptcy is to stop creditors from exercising rights in a way that's going to hurt the debtor. Over time, though, courts said, well, actually, like, these aren't agreements with the debtor. They're agreements between creditors, so maybe we will enforce them according to their terms. The, the latest trend is kind of in between, but not quite. It's to say, we're going to enforce them, but only if they're extra, extra clear. And the phrase that comes up in cases is, they're clear beyond peradventure. If the contract is super, super clear, we'll enforce it, but otherwise we won't. So if it's so obvious that the second lien has waived some right in the proceeding, then we'll enforce that waiver. Now what's weird about that standard is how does it become obvious? It becomes really broad. So if you say, I waive everything, then they'll enforce a waiver. That's a strange incentive to give to parties. Like if you really want to waive this one right, you have to waive all these other rights to make it enforceable. And so that's what brought us to this idea of writing about this. These don't seem like the right ways to think about how to enforce a contract term. You want to think about, do you enforce it? And then you want to think about, do you enforce it for damages? Do you enforce it specifically? And that's really what we model out in the agreement, is, is how to think about the enforcement mechanism for these contracts. All right, just to give an example, I'll, I'll talk about Radio Shack. Uh, with these methods showing up in the case law, what judges talk about, We've, we theorize that, in some sense, it's all driven by the outcome. So if you go through all of these not enforce, enforce, enforce when it's really clear, 
often you'll find that the driving thing is this ends up with the deal that helps the debtor. So it's very outcome driven. Uh, and so I'll just give you an example of, of Radio Shack. Judge Shannon, the then chief judge of the Delaware Bankruptcy Court, is in one of the hearings says to the lawyer for the person who ultimately lost in the battle, I know your client has rights, rights in these intercreditor agreements, this is the first lien lender, and I'm not trying to really stick it to anybody, but you have to appreciate how difficult it is to stomach that those rights were gonna end a sale that was gonna be valuable to the debtor. This is the first bankruptcy of Radio Shack. The only p plan that was gonna save the, the company, although it ends up in second bankruptcy, not saved. But the only plan at the time that was gonna save the company was one that the first lien could block because of their rights. And he says, you know, I know that the contracts might say that, but this is really hard to stomach. And if you talk to the lawyer who was at the kind of receiving end of the statement, he goes, listen, our client realized at some point someone was going to get stuck to them, and we were the ones who ended up there, and so we ended up having to settle. What, is the, what did the dispute look like? So you had a group of senior lenders and a group of junior lenders, and they had an intercreditor agreement that said how they would behave. This group wanted to buy Radio Shack out of bankruptcy. This group didn't want them to do it. Complicated even more was each of these groups was separated into subgroups that had intercreditor agreements that said how they could behave. And they formed alliances in bankruptcy that looked like this. So this creditor was defecting from this agreement to join this creditor who was defecting from this agreement who was joining this creditor who wanted to defect from this agreement to buy Radio Shack. And ultimately the court enforces some of them, doesn't enforce some of them, and the company gets sold. What do we do with this? How do we think about these transactions in bankruptcy? All right, our paper presents a proposal. To get there, I want to give you two very simplified example models to show how side agreements can benefit a debtor and how they can hurt a debtor, and then talk about how that tells us what we should do with them. Key assumptions in the models. The parties are going to end up in a state of the world, a good bad state or a bad state, and they can't contract over that state of the world. So they're just going to say, we want to give control to one of the creditors in bankruptcy, and we know that there's a 50% chance we end up in a good state or a bad state. And this is just to demonstrate the point, we make that assumption. The junior creditor, the one who's bound by the agreement in the first version of this model, is going to be the one who gets to choose what to do. So the junior creditor has to make a choice, the question is whether or not they're allowed to make that choice or not. Uh, and the junior can bargain with the other creditors who aren't in the agreement, but the senior can't. Now that's a lot, it'll make a little more sense when I put up the next slide. All right, so we have our senior creditor, our junior creditor, and let's call these the unsecured creditors. Now we do this because this is the way the intercreditor system normally plays out. The key is that this creditor binds this creditor, and this creditor is not a party. That's the key, but usually it's the senior creditor binding the junior, and then you have your unsecured creditors watching it. All right, There's, these are the payouts that you're gonna see in bankruptcy. So you have a good state and a bad state, and they have to make a choice. We've assumed the choice is between supporting a plan of reorganization or a liquidation. That doesn't have to be the issue. It could be supporting uh, debtor financing. It could be, uh, um, assuming a contract. But this is the big decision. Do we reorganize the firm or do we liquidate the firm? And these are the payouts that they expect to get from all those decisions. So the senior creditor in the good state wants to liquidate because uh, they get 200, whereas they get 120 in reorganization. In the bad state, they get 200 with liquidation and 120 with reorganization. But the junior, and the junior has the same payouts, but the unsecured creditors have different payouts in reorganization and liquidation. So these are the choices they have to make. The person making the choice is going to be the junior. They're going to vote for or against reorganization or liquidation. Now, as an alliance, the senior and the junior want to maximize this line here. right? They want to get the, the expected outcome the best in this line. We, kind of looking at the best system, want to maximize this line, the collective payout to the whole group in these uh, setups. All right. So now the question is, what, what happens with agreements? Let's do it without an agreement. The junior will always choose the reorganization because that's better. So the junior chooses that. We get 210 in the good state, 150 in the bad state. So sometimes we get the right outcome. Sometimes we get the wrong outcome. Uh, the expected outcome of that is 180. We would have preferred an expected outcome of 205 if we had chosen 200 in a bad state. 
That's no agreement. So S and J could agree ahead of time to say, no, J, you have to make a decision that, that benefits us when this bankruptcy arrives. So one version of that agreement is you specifically perform, which is to say senior creditor makes the junior creditor do whatever it says. If we do that, then the senior creditor forces the junior to choose to liquidate in both sets of the world. Now, under that state of the world, we do better than the previous one, but we're still not optimal because we're choosing 200 in the good state, 200 in the bad state, but we could have got 210 in the good state if we had different incentives. Right? That's, that's the specific performance version of the agreement. Now, what if we do damages? And there's two ways to do damages. You can set damages ahead of time, or you can have expect, expect, expectation damages. So if the senior sues the junior for breaching, then there'd be expectation damages of 80, because 120 versus 200, right? That's the, that's the damage to the senior by the breach. If they have stipulated damages, what they're going to do is enter an agreement to get as much value from the C as possible. Now, this is where the bargaining is important. C can bargain with, bargain with J, so C offers J to pay it to choose R in both states, but J only accepts it in this state because J says, all right, you give me 70, I'll pay 90 to the senior. I'll choose this state of the world. Here, you can't give me enough to pay the 90 to the senior. So we'll go 210 in this state of the world and 200 in this state of the world. So you can see that the stipulated damages gets the right outcome in both states of the world. So does the expected damages, but stipulated damages is better for, C and, for S and J because they extract more value from the junior. All right, so then you see that not enforcing the agreements is bad. Enforcing them specifically is suboptimal. Enforcing them for damages does better. All right, now, that said, you can change the numbers and get the stipulated damages to be problematic. If we change these numbers here, the junior and senior will try to extract 100 from the, from the unsecured creditors by making stipulated damages 120. That's not enough to get the payoff here, even though we'd rather do that. But they're going to bet on all this. 50% this, of this is better than the 50% of this. So they're going to take the 100 here get all that value, and then end up with 200 here. The reason, and so uh, you get the expected outcome of 212 point, or sorry, 200 and, sorry, stipulated damage of 120, get to an expected total outcome of 220, but S and J get 220 in expected damages, whereas with, ex, with, with in expected outcome, whereas with expectation damages of 80, you're gonna do it differently. They pay 80 here, 80 here, we get 210 and 240 which means that the expected outcome for everybody is 225, but S and J only get 212.5. The intuition then is when they get to choose between stipulated damages and expectation damages, they try to extract too much value from C, and they get the wrong socially suboptimal outcome, which in all of these then means expectation damages gets us the best outcome. And that's true as long as the assumption that S can't bargain is, is true. Now, if I flip it around and allow S to bargain, but J not to bargain, so J, S, is the one making the, S is the one talking to C and getting a side payment, then we don't know the outcome. We don't know the best rule. Specific performance and stipulated damages cause C and S, who can't bargain with J, to ignore J's harms. Expectation damages cause S and J to ignore C's harms because C is going to be trying to pay J but can't bargain with him. Now, all of this turns on someone not being able to bargain. We don't need any rule if everyone can bargain after the fact. Yeah. All right. Ideally, this, the court knows whether or not there are externalities on C and J, because if there aren't, we don't care. And the court knows what, who has the ability to bargain. Now, we don't, the court won't know that, so we have to come up with a rule that fixes this without knowing it. All right. So our proposal, then, is we should always have expectation damages unless we know there are no externalities. Why? Because expectation damages in the state where J can't, in the first set of examples, expectation damages always get you the right outcome. In the second, they get you the wrong one. But they only get you the wrong one because when we are having, uh, sorry, they only get you the wrong one 
because there's an over-assertion of rights by the junior. And an over-assertion of rights, if you're a judge saying, you proposed the plan you shouldn't, you voted on something you shouldn't, gets more information to the judge. It's costly because there's too much information, but it's easy to fix because the judge can say, that's a bad plan. Whereas not getting any information, it's hard to fix because the judge doesn't have it before them. All right. So ultimately then, we want to have the expectation damages in all cases, which is very similar to what we do throughout bankruptcy. We're saying there's a party that's critical, a voice that needs to be heard. That's Jay's voice. You're going to allow them to be heard, but, you're going to, but they're going to have to pay for it, which is like when we cram down and we say, you can take an asset out, but you can, you, you, you can get paid for an asset, but you can't remove it from the going concern of the firm. All right, so in the end then, we want to keep that voice in, but we have a payment that has to be made. Uh, that's the proposal of it. Thanks, Anthony. That was a great paper. So I'll try and uh, contextualize this uh, discussion about side contracts in the Indian IBC context. Now, just to give you a broader framework, uh, Chapter 11, or for that matter, the US Bankruptcy Code is based on an assumption that uh, there's enough judicial capacity to handle uh, critical questions of valuations, etc. Whereas in India, the assumption was that the judicial capacity uh, is low. Therefore, uh, how do you design a bankruptcy law with minimal uh, role for the courts? And uh, so a lot of uh, that will play out as we uh, go uh, into, the, into, into seeing how the Indian law uh, will work on this. So what are the key takeaways from uh, the paper? Uh, the first thing is that integrator agreements do not necessarily reduce transaction cost. In certain cases, uh, it might just uh, lead to more transaction costs in the sense of litigation, etc. Uh, enforcement may lead to value destruction for a non-party stakeholder. Uh, I prefer to call this more like a wealth extraction or a value transfer. Uh, so uh, the core question then becomes that when should the court enforce uh, ICA, that is an intercreditor agreement, and when it shouldn't. Uh, so the paper suggests that uh, the expectations damages is value maximizing in certain set of uh, uh, cases. Uh, as against specific performance and stipulated damages. Now, that's broadly the key takeaways. Now, with that, let me get into the Indian context and uh, uh, try to explain what's, uh, why side agreements are important in the Indian IBC uh, law. Okay, so before I go into this, uh, let's understand a bit of a difference between uh, Chapter 11 and uh, the Indian law. So, uh, Chapter 11 works on the basis that first you have to do a class formation. Uh, taking into account the interests of the different classes of creditors. And then there's negotiation across all classes of claimants, right? Now, therefore, there's an opportunity for each class of claimant to play a role in deciding as to the future of the company, whether it will be liquidated or it will be resolved through a restructuring, etc., or a sale transaction. But in the Indian context, uh, because we do not want the court to play too much of a role and the uh, function of the court has to be very objective, uh, this decision as to whether the company will continue or not is given to a committee of creditors. And this committee comprises of financial creditors and not operational creditors. And as, as I'll explain through this example, that leads to an inherent liquidation bias in certain cases, right? So let's, let's take the example of a company C which has senior financial creditors who uh, have a debt value of 100, which is like 77%. So under the Indian law currently, uh, the committee of creditor comprising of financial creditors uh, decide by 66% or two-third of votes. So essentially, the senior financial creditors can decide on the future of this company. The junior financial creditors have 30 and the operational uh, creditors have 20, right? Uh, let's assume that the liquidation value at uh, the stage one is 90. In that case, essentially, the senior creditors get the entire 90, right? Now, let's assume with 0.5 probability that there are two states of the world in the future, one the good state and the bad state. In the good state, the value of the company goes to 200, and in the bad state, it goes down to 50. If it goes up to 200, then the senior financial creditor gets 100. The junior financial creditor gets 30, the operational creditor gets 20. In case of bad state, the only the senior financial creditor gets 50, the rest gets zero, right? They get nothing. Therefore, the expected uh, returns for the senior financial creditor in, uh, if the company is continued is 75, right? Because it is 75, which is lesser than 90, right? 
the financial creditors, the senior financial creditor in the COC with six, more than 66% votes would automatically choose liquidation over continuing the company, right? Because the, the expected value on continuation of the company is 75, which is lesser than the immediate liquidation value, right? But the expected value of the company as a whole is 125, which is much more than the liquidation value, right? So if you look at this, uh, this example, because the decision as to whether the company will be continued or not is left to the financial creditors, the financial creditors have an incentive to kill off the company when ideally it should be continued. And uh, uh, the others, therefore, will take a loss in the sense the financial uh, junior creditors and the operational creditors because the company is getting liquidated. So just to put this in a more structured format, so essentially what I'm saying is that for the senior financial creditors, the liquidation option is better, 90 is better than 75, so they would liquidate. Whereas for the financial creditors who are junior and the operational creditors, they are worse off because if their expected value, if continued, was 15 and 10 respectively, whereas they are getting zero in this case, right? Now, in this context, where does side agreements come in, right? So the po one positive role that the side agreements can play, so what Anthony was saying is that under the US Chapter 11, side agreements can bypass the bankruptcy code leading to value destruction. My argument is that under the Indian law, if you follow the law itself, that might lead to value destruction and side agreements can help prevent this value destruction, right? So the role of side agreements in our law could be very different. It could actually prevent the value destruction that is inherent in the law itself. So why, why is this happening? Again, because there is no platform for bargaining between financial creditors and operational creditors, right? Now this lack of a platform being provided by the law can be solved by side agreements. Uh, that's the argument. Uh, and this uh, would essentially require the financial creditors to vote in a certain way because only, as I said, only financial creditors can be in the committee. An operational creditor by contract or otherwise cannot be on the committee. They can only enter into a contract with the financial creditors, binding the financial creditors to vote in a certain way. That's the max that can happen. So what are the issues with side agreements in India? Uh, currently, there's, uh, before I go into side agreements, the first thing is subordination agreement. Whether a financial creditor is senior or junior is determined by the subordination agreement. So the legality of the subordination agreement is itself not clear under Indian laws. Because of section 53, the way it is drafted, the insolvency law committee said that it's enforceable. However, they disregarded the fact that if there is a subordination agreement, and there is a liquidation bias, what happens in that case? The ILC uh, said, uh, we are not interested in this aspect. Uh, I don't know why. So they did not discuss that. So if this liquidation bias becomes evident before a judge, how will the judge react is something that uh, is interesting because in Indian law, uh, in the Indian uh, courts, we have seen that judges are trying to maximize value. So in that case, if the side agreement is leading to a liquidation, maybe the judge would prefer not to liquidate the company and therefore not enforce the side agreement. Secondly, the NCLT has recently recommended the need for developing a standard operating procedure for the COC, right? In that case, this might limit the discretion or the contractual freedom of the financial creditors on the COC itself. Uh, there's another case uh, recently called the Sirpur Mill case, where uh, which has really uh, uh, changed a very critical aspect of the law because uh, what, uh, the, the, the court has said that a plan cannot discriminate financial creditors, dissenting financial creditors. So we are not yet sure how this actually impacts uh, the way plans are being uh, uh, you know, prepared now. And the second is I think India is probably the only law, uh, the IBC is the only law that provides for a valuation comparator uh, for a sale transaction. Now, if you see the uh, chapter 11 under section uh, 1129, they provide for a, a valuation comparator, which is the liquidation value, uh, as a benchmark for restructuring transactions. However, Indian law does not have two separate chapters for sell as against uh, restructuring. So the valuation comparator for restructuring is applicable to a sell transaction also. However, the Sirpur Mill case has now struck down this valuation comparator itself which is there in the regulation. There's still a valuation comparator in the law. So it's not, again, clear how much minimum a resolution plan needs to pay the operational creator and the dissenting financial creator. So this complicates 
the possibility of entering into a side agreement in the first place. So, uh, with that, I think uh, it would be useful to get your sense of how do you see uh, the, the, uh, the, the liquidation bias playing out in reality and whether at all do you think side agreements could be a solution to that problem. Thank you. All right. Um I'm sorry, uh, Anthony, but I'm going to skip over to the next paper because we are way off schedule. Uh, so may I request people who have questions for Anthony or Pratik to please take it over lunch? I'm sorry about this.